Some of us may have tried a whiskey and coke or two at a party at some point in our lives, but what about the whiskey we often see cowboys on TV and in movies drinking down, one shot after another? Was it anything like what we know today as American or bourbon whiskey? Your license may permit you to keep a medicinal store of whiskey, but this is no whiskey. Perhaps you're not used to frontier whiskey. The fact of the matter is, the whiskey of the Wild West was a true horror in history. While many of today's American whiskey bottles are imbued with classic Old West imagery such as vast frontiers, big game animals, and 19th century men whose large mustaches could make even Yosemite Sam blush, the whiskey that modern imbibers drink today would likely taste very different to the cowboys of the Wild West. And just the same, Old West whiskey would be virtually unrecognizable to us today. Today's whiskey distilleries can proudly state on their bottles the age and quality of their whiskey with credible experience to back it up. However, these brands appeared some time after the West was no longer wild, and so quality control of their products was taken much more seriously. You could say your product was Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey aged 10 years, while lying through your teeth as thirsty cowboys gladly drank something that tasted closer to turpentine. In fact, following the years after the Civil War, only 10% of what we today would recognize as genuine bourbon whiskey made its way to the market. The majority of the so-called whiskey was pumped out by large distilleries as flavorless, neutral grain spirits that were high in alcohol, but low in quality and were nearly indistinguishable from one brand to the other. This high octane rocket fuel was then sold to merchants who would then refine it through additional distilling and adding of flavors and colorings to better mimic actual whiskey. The resulting concoctions were sold off to wholesalers who purchased the spirits in bulk and generated their own whiskey brands by adding personal ingredients to the mixture. Some whiskey moving west may have actually started as a true bourbon, but somewhere along the way to a local cowboy saloon, it was typically mixed with more water, neutral spirits, and other additives to grow supply and increase profits. That bourbon whiskey the cowboy was eyeing on the shelf could very well have been distilled from a low-grade molasses and other additives such as burnt sugar, old chewing tobacco, sulfuric acid, or worse yet, strychnine, an actual poison that can be lethal in large doses, about as crooked as a bourbon can get. One example of deadly Wild West whiskey was a libation aptly named tarantula juice for the bite it caused from the added strychnine and the resulting muscle spasms and sensation of tiny spiders crawling across the skin once the drink wore off. Two rounds of the drink were often ordered, the first to feel the potent effects, and the second to ward off the unpleasant withdrawals and kill the tiny spiders. The whiskey industry of the 1800s was absolutely plagued with this sort of dishonest behavior, and it was years before reformers in and outside of the business were able to gain enough support to introduce any kind of quality control. Supporters of whiskey reform within the industry were distillers like Colonel Edmund Haynes Taylor Jr., whose namesake is carried on the bottles of E.H. Taylor, a very popular bourbon today and George Garvin Brown, who pushed for quality control practices that helped create the Bottled and Bond Act of 1897. The act gave the U.S. government control of a bottled and bond whiskey's quality, requiring that the whiskey was made all at one distillery and that the distillery was correctly labeled on the bottle, a far cry from the days of snake oil salesmen peddling volatile hooch in the untamed West. Then in 1906, President Theodore Roosevelt's Pure Food and Drug Act added regulations for whiskey, along with many other consumable products. And despite the progress the president helped achieve with the whiskey industry, Roosevelt himself was not much of a drinker, only ever sipping a mint julep or two on rare occasions. Or as he put it, I never drink but one mint julep at a time. I doubt if I have drunk a half dozen a year. Though it's interesting to note the main ingredient that's in a mint julep is bourbon. So it's comforting to know that while President Roosevelt tended to stray away from the drink, he could still appreciate what it means to have quality whiskey. Back to the 21st century, Quality whiskey has become more of a subjective topic rather than an objective one, as was the case in the 1800s. You're unlikely to consume something that's more akin to paint thinner rather than a distilled spirit when picking up a bottle of bourbon today. Instead of being used to wet the whistles of parched, dust-bitten cowboys looking to forget the day's hardships, modern whiskey and its relative quality lends itself to being savored, shared, and experimented with. Though there are times and places where the wild roots of whiskey drinking can still be experienced, plenty of bars around America still have special hours and nights where dollar shots of cheap whiskey and other spirits are often taken advantage of by burned out college students looking to let off some steam from the hectic school week. And so it's not surprising modern distilleries love to harken back to iconic frontier imagery on their whiskey bottles. 
The tangible lightness of the lawless days of whiskey sure is more enticing over the true, underappreciated proponents of modern American whiskey, bureaucracy, and the ever-present marketing machine. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more videos like this one. Thanks for watching Horrors and History.